Steve Wright, a very, very warm welcome to 10Q Interview. Thank you for joining me this morning. How are you, sir? I'm very well, Chris. Uh, pleasure to be here chatting to you on my, on my new microphone, brought specially for you, because you very kindly actually told me uh, <laughs> what I should be, uh, what the setup should be, because um, I'm trying to elevate it a little bit, and, and yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sounding cool, I'm sat, yeah. Do, do you know what's you really know? funny, Steve, so, I, like, so obviously I've, I've got a marketing background, but I'm not really into sort of the audio and video as such, and everywhere you read, they go, oh, you know, audio is the most important. You know, whether it's video, whether it's podcast, it doesn't matter. Audio is what is the is the killer. And I never really thought too much about it. I mean, obviously, I bought myself a fancy mic, but my my hearing is not good enough, I didn't think, to notice any difference. <laughs> However, so the listeners and viewers who are here, like when you came on and you had the wrong mic, I couldn't believe how different it sounded. All right. But good. It sounds incredible. So plug out. You, yeah. got, you got the Rode USB one, right? I got it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Barry White special. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Barry. Uh, yeah, and and it's good. I mean, yeah, that's one thing I was saying. I I always uh, like. I mean, you can just go and buy the top end of everything in life, yeah. you know, and that's great. But you never actually really appreciate the benefits that comes with having something so good. So I always try to, especially with the cameras, I always push my cameras to the maximum of maybe that like low lighting um technica uh you know know how they work in low lighting or shutter speed or whatever and you find a point where you think oh i wish i just had a bit more this or a bit more that and yeah. then you actually go and buy a new model of camera or a new mic and then you can actually clearly see the, the progression or the jump in quality so i think that's really good actually and i think nowadays as with most things, it used to be quite clear the difference between something cheap and something expensive. But I think yeah. now, as time goes on, that gap is getting such, you know, so close now. You know, yeah. talking about cameras, you know, now, you know, t 10 years ago, you take a picture on, on your phone. Oh, you look terrible. Now, you know, it's, it's hard. It's hard push to, you know, tell the difference between yeah. that and, uh, you know, and, and a professional camera. Yeah, I think I got, I think mine's, I mean, someone will probably correct me in the comments or whatever, but I, I'm pretty sure mine's like a 20 megapixel camera. Mm -hmm. And then you throw in all these sort of AI uh, special effects that Apple add to mm -hmm. it and the portrait mode and the rest of it. Yeah, it really is pretty impressive. But then it's not down to the quality. It's not down how many megapixels. I was uh, in Vegas uh, and I was out there and there was this uh, photographer's uh, gallery. And um, all these pictures he had in there, you know who it is when I mention the picture, but well, you know the picture, it's of a big grizzly bear standing in the middle of a, of a stream and this salmon literally just jumps into his mouth. Big right. old bear literally jumps into his mouth. <clears throat> it looks completely photoshopped, but, but no, it was, you know, taken at the time exactly how it was probably about 20 years ago. And then also we had another picture in there of this eagle soaring in the sky. And it was this massive print, and it was, I don't know, it was sort of like two metres by a metre wide, massive print. I think it was charging probably about $30,000 for it, but <laughs> it was Vegas. Uh, and then when you read the actual spec on it, it was it was taken on like a 35 mil camera, 35 mil of film. And you just think nowadays, well, you know, you want something, you know, you want all your megapixels for that. But it just goes to show if the picture is is of a good enough if the subject is good enough if the yeah. picture captures your imagination and really you know does something it doesn't really actually matter how you know good the or how large the pixels are or whatever no. it's, people get wrapped up in oh i need more megapixels at the end of the day it's, it's it's what you're actually taking pictures of that is the key thing and yeah you know and that's why you know you, you know the pictures taken at parties when you've had a few uh <laughs> I usually sum of the best pictures because you just got something there at hand at the right minute. You just capture it. Everything's working right. You just get that, you know, lovely shot. If you try to set that up again with, yeah. you know, lights, big setup, whatever, you just wouldn't get that spontaneity. So it's down to sort of like the picture and the, um, and the subject matter is what makes a good picture, not necessarily how good the actual camera is. Okay. 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna cut you off there because I feel like <clears throat> you've got a lot of advice and wisdom to share on the subject of photography. But I'm gonna take you back a little bit and ask you why photography. How did you get started? Well, I didn't want to be a photographer. I want to be a carpenter. Did you? Uh, I want to be a carpenter. I, I very love woodwork. Uh, I always enjoyed it at uh, at school. For my project, I built a beehive because also I, I enjoyed beekeeping. Bizarre for sixteen year old. Do you still do beekeeping now? <laughs> I don't, I really want to, but uh, my wife she she says she's allergic to bee stings. Right. I think I think she's just doing that just so she she can say, you know, if mm. you get a beehive, I might die. You know, so <laughs> you kind of. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. I said, look, you can get tests just to see if you are because it was a long time ago she had an allergic reaction. So no, now I'm I'm not beekeeping anymore. Which is you, a shame because I do you, enjoy it. Are you aware of a guy called Alex Smith on YouTube? Uh, is he American? No, he's a he's a young English lad. Right. Yeah. But he he did a load of videos last year and this year. He's done this year as well on beekeeping. Okay. And I had no interest in beekeeping. Like for me, it's just like whatever. And me and my wife sat and watched. Yeah, he had all these like series. I was telling another guest this about this as well. He had this series where he'd like you know week one, week two, week three, and then he had a big YouTube video where he he'd um, sewn them all together. It was like an epic. It was like an hour and forty five minutes or something. And me and my wife just sat there one evening after the kids had gone to bed and watched the whole lot. And then one, once it had finished, we were like, "What have we just watched?" I'll, I'll share the link in the show notes and I'll send it to you as well, right. Steve. It's but if you're into beekeeping, like I thought it was really yeah. good. I thought it was very creative, <clears throat> and I'd love to get him on the podcast. But I will share it with you because it was, it was, yeah, it was, it was very cool. But anyway, I digress. You're into beekeeping, and you built a beehive when you were 16. Be a, yeah. So, uh, so then I went to uh, this is in uh, Norwich. I went to the city college to actually sit there entrance exam because obviously at that time in what 86, I think. A lot of people would be carpenters. It was a big thing in '86, apparently, and because of that, I uh, I didn't I didn't make the cut. Sorry for the pun. Um, <laughs> now my my, my my dovetails didn't didn't fly away. No, they were just you know, and I didn't get in. So I thought, oh god, I don't know what I'm getting. So I'd always liked photography, and I was interested in photography. So I thought, oh yeah, yeah, I thought I'd, I'd be you know I'd be a photographer. So so that didn't happen straight away. So I had to go and sign on. And then when you sign on, you have to write there, uh, will you accept any job that comes along? So I said, no, I want to be a photographer. So I'll only accept <laughs> photography jobs. So the woman said, look, it's very it's not nice quite how it works, Steve. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't quite work like that, you know. <laughs> uh, but then uh, she said, uh, but actually, uh, one of my colleagues is, is uh, trying to place uh, an assistant with a photographer. He's had two and they've both bailed out. They haven't been, you know didn't work so right. you know would you you know would you be up to being a you know an assistant on a on a yts scheme 25 pounds a week uh back in 1986 uh i said yeah so i was an assistant uh to him for like two years uh, and it was really good it was really good i mean i didn't go to college didn't go to uni to learn to do photography did it on the job and uh yes he was very he was very technically uh good his people skills probably weren't the best. <laughs> Hence his I, two previous <laughs> failing assistants, right? Yeah. Uh, obviously, it's something to do with shut in a dark room with no windows for eight hours a day, probably. But no, it, it was very good. It was a good grounding, good grounding, um, knowing all the technical sides of it. Yeah. And then from there, after about two years there, because um, I didn't take a year out like most people do, I thought, okay, I need to go and travel the world a bit now, see a bit of the world. Okay. So I was born in Sheringham, Sheringham, a bit of a Norfolk boy. And um, I, I played golf there, fun fact. Yeah, very, so, does, so does my uh, brother in law. Up on the cliff, was it Was yeah, it windy? Yeah, yeah. It was, was it windy? windy? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it is always windy. I lost a fair few balls that day, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so yes, yeah, so I, I signed up and became a, a cruise ship photographer. Which was which was a bit daunting because my photography skills was was okay. But at what age was this? Um, this was probably I went on there when I was sort of like nineteen. Oh wow, okay. Probably nineteen, just going over. Yeah, it was, I was nearly twenty. Yeah, nearly twenty. Because I can remember um, going on the ship, and for the first few days there wasn't any passengers on there. 
and the one thing so being a cruiser photographer is 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 a bit like being in the army and okay. being on big and being on big brother you know at the same time because okay. there is rules what you have to follow um you know dinners at so and so this and that. and the other the other thing is though you are in this ship all together for like 7 months you know and it wasn't one of these massive ships it was sort of like 600 passengers so quite small really compared to modern day ships and you was with everybody uh and you know it was it was a bit of groundhog day three and four day cruising so <laughs> different sets of passengers coming there and then you just get to know the you know the the croupiers there the dancers the um the lighting technicians you know and it was on my 20th birthday i've got this picture of me sitting in this cabin uh surrounded by dancers uh <laughs> There's me thinking, wow, <laughs> wow, this is what I've been missing for the last yeah. 20 years. Uh, yeah, so that was very good. But um, yeah, the learning curve on there was was quite uh, quite high because well, photography is pretty simple. It's just, yeah, 125, F8, Mets flash, boom. It's very much a repetitious type photography, right. like future photography. You, you set yourself in one spot, people walk past, you try and get a picture of them. And the next one goes, whatever. Either. So was, was this like was this was this portrait stuff, or was this as they were this having was, dinner with the captain and in their tuxes kind of stuff? Well, it, it, in three days, obviously, first one welcome aboard, yeah. uh, second shot uh, lifeboat drill, um, third shot uh, captain's cocktail, uh, fourth shot portraits, fifth shot short excursions, uh, seventh shot uh, table shots. Uh, eight shots uh, could have been like the um, the show talent show. Right. So you got about nine photos. If I came to you, I'm, I see you probably love having your picture taken. Um, once would be fine, twice okay, but yeah. nine times in three days. Well, it, by the end of that, you're getting a bit pissed off. You think, yeah. oh, no, come on, put it back. The thing is, you, you you took so many pictures because you had to sell two pictures of everybody before you broke even, and then once you you know, sold two pictures of everybody. The third picture is actually what you got paid because it wasn't so, uh, it wasn't a commission basis. It worked out around about a, a dollar a passenger ahead per day. Six hundred passengers, three day cruising, eighteen hundred dollars you had to make to pay off all your bills, which is obviously being on the ship, uh, the cut to the ship, the cut to the company. Oh, uh, so you, so you weren't <clears throat> you weren't being paid so by the cruise company. You were on there and you had to earn a living. You had to earn a living. Oh, so, blimey. Okay. So, yeah. So that's, so that's why you had to make sure you, you sold all these pictures. And if you don't take the picture, obviously there's nothing to sell. And then if you don't take a picture and people are looking happy in it, they're not going to buy it. They're not going to buy a picture of them looking. You know, so were you, were you developing them all as well? Because I, I <laughs> guess, I mean, <clears throat> there'll be people listening to this who've got no idea of the process of how it was in, in the late eight, the eighties, did you say? Yeah. 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 It's not like it, now it was, where you just airdrop <clears throat> it to your computer and, and. Well, the ship was, a, the ship was a converted merchant Navy ship built in 1950. Uh, and it had been sort of like converted into this passenger ship. So the processing deck was this small little hole down the base near the kitchen that got to sort of like, you know, 50 degrees in there i just had shorts and a string vest it was a a, a durst mini printer very manual uh, a, a jobo dip and dunk system so you just ran the paper everything was manual all manual right. and and then the uh, the pictures came off like this big string of um photos and then you had to literally cut them all up each one of them up take them upstairs put them up in the display cabinet the display cabinet we had you know the one they didn't have doors on, so we had to bloody well put the pictures up every time, take them down. And it's fine if you're just doing 50 pictures. When you've got like five from the pictures, you've got to put them up there. You must have been doing some serious hours in this. Oh, it was, uh, I think the captain was the only one, who, well, he probably didn't, was the only one busier than me. I mean, saying that though, <laughs> the photographer usually did earn, earn the most money, you know. Okay. The one who didn't earn the most money was uh, the DJ. She was called Kathy, right, mad girl. And to earn a bit more money, she used to dress up as a um, teddy bear for us to go around doing some shots in the evening with sort of like some props. <laughs> and then she would just go and jump on their laps and, and do all that. So, yeah, 
And then we used to hire the dancers as well for Greek night. We used to get two dancers either side of the door. As people go in, just grab them, quit the picture. Any any excuse to take a picture, we were there to do it, take the picture. Um, so that's really good. It sounds like a pretty um, a great way to get <clears throat> to get started, to, to, to learn your trade almost. It was a rite of passage. It, yeah. it, was, it was. And the trouble is also, you know, there's two photographers. So um, literally, you didn't make your money until the last process of the day or the last sale of the day when the people are coming off. So they land or, or they, they dock and they're coming off at sort of like 9, 30, 10 o'clock. That is usually the time you make your money because the night before was the table shots. Yeah. So obviously they met all the friends, so they actually come up for those pictures. And then you've probably got about an hour, two hours before three o'clock, the new passengers come on. And then when the new passengers come on, depending the mix of passengers was depending on, on what um, language the announcement was going to be in first off. <clears throat> so right. if it started off in English, it was okay. But when they start off in Greek or, or something like that, you know, because <laughs> no, no, I mean, even back then it was sort of like five pounds a picture. You know, and it was quite expensive. Was it? Yeah. Blimey. If it started, though, in Japanese, oh, <laughs> <laughs> they would literally buy pictures. And there was in the background of somebody else's picture. So you had the person <laughs> there. And, they're in the, and they'd just buy that. They just, oh, I loved them. That didn't happen that often. So it, it was a very, it was a very, the photography, uh, you, you know, was, was one thing which wasn't too technical, really. Right. What I did learn then was how to actually um, chat to people quickly. Because yeah. if you're going to, you know, walk up to something, if they don't like you within three or four seconds, you know. You know. So, yes, that's why, you know, develop the smiley face and get in there. <laughs> and go in there. And, I, guess, yeah. I guess for those listening and watching who don't know you, I, I feel like it's fair that you maybe just give a quick overview of where you're at now and what you're doing. So people can sort of see where you were, how you started, and actually what you're doing these days. Uh, yeah, so unlike most people on LinkedIn who like started their business two or three years ago, I started 35 years ago as a photographer, um, as an assistant, and literally through all that time I've been working as a self-employed photographer. And it's been good, and, and I do work for a large variety of customers and clients or whatever um right from like Fred and Monge down to one man you know sandwich bar I mean it is literally the whole breadth of it and I enjoy every single style of photography um level I don't just sort of like pigeonhole myself just to say right I'm only doing this stuff I like the variety of photography right. and, and that has served me well <clears throat> for the last 35 years um in that time photography has changed quite a bit when I started, it was all um, very much um, five, four transparencies. Uh, over the years, it's now going to digital. Uh, and there came, a, 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 I suppose, a point maybe sort of like five years ago where I was thinking, um, you know, where it was going more social media side. Yeah. Uh, that I was thinking, if, if I'm not careful, I'm just going to, you know, turn into a bit of a dinosaur and be one of those photographers that say, oh, no, no, I, I'm old school. I'll just, you know, carry on doing what I'm doing. And, and you know, if it doesn't, doesn't make me, won't worry about that. But I thought, no, you know, I don't want I don't want my last, you know, last decade as a photographer to be sort of like on the way down. I thought, no, I'm going to embrace it and um, embrace a bit of social media and, and go for it. So I started on LinkedIn because I thought that was going to be the one for me rather than facebook or anything like that because i yeah. don't do weddings or babies or bar mitzvahs or stuff have like you, that have I'm you ever done those things i have done them <laughs> quick okay my first wedding i ever did when i was literally 18 uh before i'd been on the cruise ships uh it was it was a uh, it was a friend of my mum's and she said oh you know their daughter's getting married can you do the wedding i said okay i'll do the wedding and i had my uh mami rb67 big camera you know doing this and they were sort of like slightly new age, whatever. And I didn't know how to control people then, you know. And literally, yeah. I was just following them around. In the end, I was taking their pictures in the graveyard, you know. Because <laughs> they, they were like, oh, yeah, whatever. And, and, and I had to go away. I then went away on holiday with a, with a friend to, um, to Spain. And I was so worried about the pictures. So they got sent into the lab. And while I was away, I uh, I got my dad to you know go and pick them up and have a look at them to see if they was okay. Yeah, 
<laughs> they were. Wed- wedding, weddings, weddings are like a military operation, aren't they? When it comes to the photography thing, <sighs> very, very, uh, very true. Uh, now, now, whereas before I was the sheep, now I'm definitely the shepherd. And yeah. and you just basically with weddings, you just have to very nicely, but just control Firmly. them like sheep. Yeah, yeah, you know, and just gently, you know, ease them here and and let people know what's going to happen. Um, yeah, so so I don't mind doing weddings, uh, but I don't do weddings, you know. Um, yeah, <laughs> too much stress. <laughs> so so no, so sort of like sort of like five years. Ago, I thought, okay, I'm going to try and get a bit more, you know, a bit more social media, and then you know i started linkedin and did a few posts and that was that and then, you know carried on doing the photography and then i suppose you could say it was covid probably just before that i thought no i'm you know because everybody says you've got a niche you've got yeah. a niche you know that that's the buzzword everybody always says so so uh i thought well you know my my style of photography is pretty much down to my personality when i come to photograph you you know yeah. you can't help smiling when you you know, when I'm taking your picture, because I just, you know, give all that sort of like, you know, that good vibe over there. You know, you look at three pictures, you know, all of them can be sort of like somebody smiling, but, you know, you don't know how that picture is actually captured or taken. And yeah. I think it's the energy of the photographer when they come along to a photo shoot that really does help to energize a situation, uh, especially when it's in. Uh, I suppose my little niche is actually photographing people in their workplaces. So okay. I go around to factories, offices, uh, you, you name it. I go in there, I go into their workplace, which is their their little space. And I'm sort of like coming in there. And um, and then I have to actually get some pictures of them working. Uh, and it's so funny. Hey, hey Billy. Hey, God. Oh, you just, <laughs> you know, the amount of... Uh, of uh, of, of banter that goes on when I go into a uh, into a workplace, uh, but it's all good. You just got to feed off that, and then you just got to make people feel sort of like relaxed and at ease, and you know, then caption the picture. I don't usually use lots of uh, flash; it's all sort of like available light. Yeah. And then you know, my style of photography is capturing pictures that then can so easily be used on on their website, social media, um, branding, marketing. And they're not using stock shots. They're actually using pictures of their people working, you know, in in their places, do, doing their jobs. So, yep. so that has all come from literally thirty years ago from the cruise ships. Just knowing how to engage with people, and how you know different ways to actually, you know, make them smile. Lots of little tips and tricks <clears throat> in there. And I, I guess that's the key thing. What you said there, as opposed to why I imagine there's some companies out there it will get the social media manager with their iPhone out going, right, you take the pictures. But they won't come out as good as someone with the experience you've got in photography to then find those golden shots, I assume. I think the good thing with the photographer is because he's an outside person coming to the company, yeah. they do actually wield quite a lot of power. So I can go up to CEO and say, oh, come on, Jim. Come on, don't be so starchy. <laughs> Go on, shake those shoulders, whatever. Somebody else on the shop floor wouldn't even probably haven't even seen Jim, whatever. Yeah. Um, it is really, it is really good, um, as I say, that the, the power of photographer has, and yeah. it, uh, as with all power, is how he uses that. You've got to use it carefully, and it's really just putting people in at ease, which every photographer says, you know. But what I've tried to do with my social media. And my videos that I make is actually just to show my personality come out. So when people yep. see it, you know, they see me as somebody, um, oh, yeah, you know, you look a good chap. I was, it's going to have fun because so many times, you know, people say, oh, I'd rather go to the dentist than have my picture taken. Oh, yeah. I hate having my picture taken. It really, oh, uh, and you thought, oh, really, really? So each time you have to sort of like, you know, build them up, get the energy up there. Come is, that, on, is, that, Jill. is that the phrase you hear the most as a photographer? Oh, all the time, all the time. Oh, I hope you got thick glass on that camera because if not, I'm going to crack it. Oh, <laughs> don't worry. I got this one from Pilkington. You know, it's the strongest glass they do. Uh, it's it's all that, you know. And you just got to... And it's just people's own, you know, they just feel... I don't know why people feel, you know, I don't know. They Like most people, they feel they have this image that they think they should look yep. like, whatever, which has been portrayed by social media. And... 
And and no, no. I mean, after you, after that image. I mean, if it's very tricky because you you see all these you know uh, pictures of people that you think, oh, you know, oh yes, I should look like that. My hair should look like that. Like, and you meet them, and I'm sure they're lovely. But then again, maybe after ten minutes, they get bored or whatever. Do you know what? There's all those factors. That I think that is what you said is true. But I also think it's a case of, and this is something that I feel, that I don't actually look in pictures like I think I look. Does that make sense? <laughs> I'm just looking at Tom Cruise at the moment. I don't know, <laughs> I don't, I don't know what you're saying, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. Also, also uh, sounds. I think we all sound oh, God, different. Yeah. I hate hearing my voice on an answer message. That's why I like this microphone because I'm 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 channeling Barry White now, thinking <laughs> I'm quite deep, sexy. That or Richard Burton, you know, I'll be I'm yeah. quite happy with that. But no, I think the thing is, you just it's it's not so much, you know, people do get hung up on what they look like, and you know, when you meet somebody, yes, the first thing you do is when you look at somebody, you say, okay, they are, you know, six foot tall, whatever. They're this, that, thin, fat, whatever. You you straight away you can't even help it. You do make um, you know, preconceived ideas of what that person is. Yeah, you make, but then once you start talking to somebody, you know, and you you hear their story. I mean, really, that just all gets wasted. You know, you don't think of, oh yeah, yo Chris, yeah, you know, oh yeah, I I remember him because he's really tall, whatever. Mm. If he's seven foot two, you probably would remember, but I don't think he's seven foot two. No, but you you, <laughs> you remember him because you say, actually, no, that was a really interesting conversation because he did this and he did that, and, and that's the things. And I think I think people feel that they really have to look like this poster boy or poster girl, where in reality you know, I try and capture people's personalities, you know, because everybody's yeah. got their own personality and you've just got to capture just a little look or a little, you know, smile or whatever. Uh, yeah, yeah. And normally when people have their picture taken, they, they tense up and they, they, oh, no. and, and in the head they're saying, I don't want this. I don't like this. I'm going to look awful, yeah. you know, losing battle there. So the, the trick is to say, no, come on, give me a go. Come on. <laughs> I get paid by the picture. Come on, let me take 20 pictures of you. <laughs> you know, you, you help me out if I can take your picture. Go on. You do me a favour. And, you know, oh, go on, go on then. Oh, you. Oh, you could charm the birds down from the trees, they say. It's a, a good skill to have in business. Um, I, I want to move on to the next question. It's, it's, so in general, it's about brainstorming and ideation. And obviously, as part of this podcast, I want people to come away from it with... I guess things that they, you know, takeaways that they can learn or whatever. So people might be thinking, might be listening or watching to this thinking, Oh, I want to be a photographer or even to the extent of with their social media or, or whatever. I want to be a better photographer. Does, does brainstorming and ideation come into it? Like I know you said you work with people um, in from different brands or whatever. And as a novice, I'm assuming you will go into that environment and then you do have to brainstorm right how to get the best picture right or where to put somebody or am i am i barking up the wrong tree there or is that <clears throat> no what what i do with my clients is because they say okay we need some pictures of the um of the of the offices okay. and some people okay is that it yeah just some just some pictures of the, you know and we're gonna do with these pictures oh, i don't know we're gonna do something so rather <laughs> than that which I can, I can just walk in there and just, you know, I, I'll see what shots that will work or whatever. Yeah. But um, what I usually tell my clients uh, is, okay, write a list of, of 10 things that you want to talk about, that you're proud of your company, that you're proud of your people, um, some processes that you do, some products you sell. And then, you know, and then I'll get a list and then they say, right, you know, we're very happy because we just got these new, um, you know, monitors that are quite whizzy or we're very happy. We got Jim, who's just actually, um, you know, been trained up to be a, a first aider or whatever. Right. So then I have this list of pictures there. So when I'm going around and if I find Jim, you know, uh, and I say, oh, Jim, you've just been first aider. Have you? you know, have you, have you saved him in his lives? Um I can then get a picture and then maybe in the background we can get some sort of like first aid box. I don't know. It's just, it's just, I can then take a picture and then give it a little bit of a twist to try yeah. and tie in what they want to talk about. So once they get the pictures, 
they don't have a hundred pictures and they say, right, what we're going to do with that picture, what we're going to do with that picture. They're going to say, right, you know, here's the pictures. Oh yeah, this <clears> one, <throat> we talked about our new desks. <clears throat> and yeah. actually, you know, Steve took a picture bizarrely of, of the, um, of the legs of it as it goes up and down, you know, which normally I wouldn't have took a picture of that, but because they've said that these desks actually rise automatically on their own. Yeah. Um, I've gone in there. and they can say, oh yeah, we can use that picture for it or we can use that picture for it. And then each time I do a picture of a, of a certain thing, then I will also shoot it sort of like landscape portrait so they can use it uh, as a square image or, you know, there's a bit of variety there for them. So yeah. that is one tip I always give people, tell people, you know, rather than just take the pictures and then what am I going to do with them afterwards? I think the thing is to actually think, right, what do I want the pictures to actually say? Yeah. What do I want them to actually portray? Or do I just want 10 different locations of me just smiling? Yeah. Which is all right, but, you know. You know doesn't tell bit, a story, does it? It gets a bit naff, doesn't it? You know, yeah. If you have 10 pictures of, you know, thoughtfulness, you know, um, emotion, you know, you're trying to make them slightly different rather than just doing, you know, the same shot in a different location. You're just trying to get something out of it. But then on the day, who knows, when it comes along, you might find something completely different and you go, wow, that made a good picture. That made a good yeah. picture. And then you just see, you know. Then also for uh, would-be photographers, the, the other thing is when you take the picture, how is that picture going to be used by that person? Yeah. So obviously everybody usually just sticks the person bang in the middle of the frame, right? A little bit of space up there, but that's it. So then you have like 50 pictures of the person sitting bang in the middle of the of the frame which is all fine it worked perfectly for a a square shot but a landscape one whatever so think okay they might want to use this for a double page spread in a magazine you know they're talking about you know something and yeah so let's slide him over to the left hand side so then you don't right have a sta staple in your forehead exactly yeah. And then on the other side, we'll put something, we'll have some nice, some nice and blurry, whatever, something blurry out there to put it in there. So, or I might, you know, stand them next to this very neutral wall so they can easily just drop a title on it. Yeah. Or, I mean, the, the killer crop for any photographer is uh, the hardest shot for any photographer to take. Uh, you, you, I'm teasing you now. You, you want to know what it is, don't you, Chris? You want to know I do. what's the hardest shot? The hardest shot is. For, for websites now, they have these long, thin banner shots right at the top, yep. sort of like one by 16, one by 19. And so many times they say, right, we need a picture to, to put in there. Uh, okay, so we'll put a picture of, you know, of Chris in there. <laughs> by the time you cropped it down, you, you saw it seeing that much. You yep. see him. <laughs> they have to be shot very differently with, with a much more um, wider lens uh, and a... a you need to shoot specifically for that um, crop. And then when you actually see the crop, when it comes out uh, pre-cropped, if you like, you'll go, oh, that's a very lifeless looking picture because it's so wide and there's not a lot of drama going on it. But then by the time you put your crop on it, yeah. you'll see that actually he's sitting perfectly in the right-hand side, nice lot of space on the left-hand side to put your headline titles or whatever. Yeah. So, yeah, so he's really trying to think, where the picture's going to be used, how they're going to be used, you know, what they're going to be used for before you actually take the pictures. Okay. Chicken and egg. Good tip. Good tip. Let's talk about systems and processes. I know you kind of covered processes a little bit just then, but are there any sort of specific tools or apps you use? Um, have you brought in people to help you with certain things? What's your view on all that? I think, you know, depending on the throughput, I mean, as a photographer, self-employed photographer, my, my first thing for the, the work, the reason I've been self-employed for 35 years, uh, so long and managed to keep it going is that I keep my overheads, you know, very low okay. because I always remember when I was a photographer assistant, um, he had a studio and he never went on holiday. So I said, why don't you go on holiday? He said, well, for a start, if we went on holiday, I don't get holiday pay, so mm. I'm losing money there if I go away for a week. Yeah. And also, you know, there's a week I'm still paying for the, you know, studio hire for you, for other stuff. So I've lost out twice, if you like. <laughs> so 
So that's <laughs> that was his excuse, not going hold it down or that. <laughs> um, so I've always I've always thought that because uh, being a photographer, well, at least for me, is very much peaks and troughs, feasts and famine, ups and downs. I can yeah. have a I can have a good week, I can have a good month, I can have a good year. But then also I can have a bad week, bad month, bad year. So yeah. it's trying to keep it uh, so when you're not busy, um, you uh, are not, you know, hemorrhaging money, which I would be if I had a, like a full time assistant or, or if all the work I got was sent out. And, you know, I'm very, I'm very much more of a hands on type person. So okay. all the images I actually process myself. So I just use Lightroom, Adobe Lightroom okay. to do them all in. Um, I, 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 I probably could send them out, but then again, when I look at a picture, I know <clears throat> I did a shoot the other day. Uh, I took uh, eleven hundred pictures and I thinned them down to two hundred and fifty, and that was just down to my, you know, deciding I like this picture, I don't like this picture. You Is know. that as time consuming a process as it yeah, sounds like? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, which has been, I've been talking to other photographers about it. I mean, you know, you got your know, photography and then you got your uh, processing. And uh, yeah, yeah, a lot of, I, I sort of like include that in my in my day rate. Bear mm. in mind, I know it's probably going to take, if I shoot for a day, it's probably going to take me half a day to process it. Yeah. So, you know, and that's, that's what people don't really see. That's probably the one difference between um, photography now and photography 35 years ago when you shot your film yeah that's it you know you get the film process you gave them the transparencies and and, and that was it as soon as you finished the job you didn't have to do any more you know post-production work if you like yeah um with digital no you, you know you go out shooting for a day and then you go to process all those pictures and look at them and tweak them and and all of that so I still do that. So I, I could streamline it more, but to be fair, I do enjoy it. I do enjoy the process of actually going through there because you still on a shoot when you're shooting lots of people, you, you know, you, you shoot it, you check in the camera. Yeah, it looks okay. But then actually when you come back and look at it on, on the screen, every yeah. now and again, you go, wow, that, that's a good picture. <laughs> that is a gem. That's yeah. a top draw. That one is God, Yeah, and 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 I I enjoy those moments. You know, okay. or I say no, that one's terrible. Get rid of that one. <laughs> you, see, you you mentioned obviously about keeping costs low. Where does cameras fit into that? Because I've seen the price of some cameras, like even something quite basic, is is up there. But they they can they can be pretty pricey toys, well, they can't they? They can be. They can be, but the good thing is when you are when you're a photographer buying a camera, because it's your business tool, yeah. you don't have that guilt of buying it, you know. <laughs> if you was if you was you know if you were somebody else and you like photography, you know, yeah. and then you went and spent, you know, five grand on a camera, you go, Oh god, don't go you know, I've just spent five grand on it because it's your hobby. Yeah. But when it's when it's your business you go, oh, that's, that's for business, yeah, oh, that's a tax deductible anyway. I can put all that. <laughs> Um, but in reality, uh, it's, uh, I mean, the, ca the, the camera bodies, every probably couple of years, I update my, my camera bodies. I'm, I'm a Nikon man. It's usually okay. Nikon or Canon, although okay. Sony's definitely coming into the arena now. Um, but the thing is, is it, it, you, you stick with a type of camera or system because not so much the body, it's actually the lenses, the lenses yeah. that I've got, you know, they can be. You know, it's probably like ten, fifteen thousand pounds worth of lenses. That if I suddenly change from Nikon to Canon, then so th those lenses won't fit on other brands. Is that no, what you're saying? No, no. Oh, okay, no. I didn't know that. Yeah, you can get different adapters for it, or whatever. But but no, you you pretty much pick one system you like and go with that. But then again, you know, they you know with the digital uh, bodies now coming out, you know, Nikon says, well, this this uh, lens has been, you know made specifically for this digital camera. It's all it's like it's like TVs, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> You've always got to, you know, upsell TVs and hey, let's get <laughs> let's get one of those curved TVs. Yeah, yeah. what happened to them? Let's get mm. a a three D TV, you know. Um so yeah, again it's back to the, the, the quality, you know, if you if you're buying quality, that will outweigh, you know, any any gimmicks, whatever. Yeah. And harvesting on the camera, you know, like on your phone. 
like on most things you don't actually use you only you mm. only use you know one set of things i and also with my camera setup i pretty much shoot everything on manual <clears throat> everything is sh- everything is shot on manual i don't right. i don't i don't trust well, it's not something i don't trust the um, auto exposure but if i'm taking a picture and i look in the back of the camera and you just walk past and you've got a black top on and then yeah. somebody else walked past with a white top on I mean, that is going to change the exposure of the camera. But actually, the bookcase behind you is still the same, the same exposure. Yeah. So if I ex- expose for the bookcase, uh, it doesn't matter if you're wearing black or white. When you walk okay. past the camera, um, you're not actually, the, the metering in the camera is, is not, you know, going to outweigh, um, you know, what you are, are looking for. So, yeah, so I like to keep it very much manual. Flash as well, everything manual. And then yep. say, right, half stop brighter, half stop darker. I know I am then. Okay. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I guess it, as, as the process got easier, as technologies evolved from back when you were developing in with film? Well, it's a bit, it's a bit uh, I think the technology in the, in the digital camera world is a bit bizarre. Because obviously with computers, they started off when the first computer came out, you know, it was very basic let's just say and there's, mm. there's been this natural because there was no other computers beforehand there's been this natural progression as, as computers got faster memories got you know cheaper um all these things it's this natural curve let's just say going upwards yeah but but with photography when the first digital camera was coming on i was shooting on um like a 5.4 camera which would take a piece of film which is five inches by four inches so it's literally that's the size of a piece of film yeah and honestly it it was like it was like driving around in a ferrari you know absolutely the quality that this camera could produce was fantastic and then suddenly you know the first digital camera i've got uh it was this little uh nikon cool pics thing um the memory card of it was 16k K, not not me. It's sixteen K, and the quality that came off that was like, I don't know, like stepping out of your Ferrari and and getting onto a bloody uh, skateboard. I mean, it, it was ridiculous. It was just, it was ridiculous. But because you could take the picture and people could see it there and then, suddenly yeah. everybody, everybody everybody wanted it. Yeah. It was, and and also uh, it was. Yeah, so it, it was it was quite bizarre, really, how uh, digital cameras, you know, the the ability of what they could do uh, for the you know you could see it there and then, um, mm. just load everybody into oh no I need that I need that shot on that but the quality is is you know a tenth of the quality of what I can shoot oh yeah but I can see it now and we can drop it yep. in there and over the years it has is now actually caught up and you know overtaken. Some would say uh, what you know the traditional camera's done, but it, right. it, there was there was definitely a time when you know you could either have it shot on five four or you could have it shot on you know a digital camera. Yeah. Saying that, you know, the first high end digital cameras that came out, which I was contemplating on, on buying, sort of, uh, you know, it was looking. I have a five four camera, and then I could buy this other camera. And I think it was going to be oh back then it was going to be like. 25 thirty thousand pounds to actually buy this you know camera a phase one camera and i'd save you know the film cost with it yeah thank god i didn't buy it <laughs> because you know phase one obviously you know then there was a phase two <laughs> and then there was a phase three um yeah, yeah so the, the the trick is you've got to be careful when you jump on to that that merry-go-round that you jump on at the right time yeah <laughs> yeah it's funny isn't it, tech let's talk about goals so when i mean you're self-employed now you've been doing it a long time so it's kind of it's weird for me to ask what are your goals with photography so i'm going to kind of change the question a little bit and maybe sort of say did you foresee a 35 year career self-employed career no less in photography when you sort of first started getting going was was, was, Um, was that a goal uh no no i think uh no it wasn't that i I don't know i just i enjoyed photography and that was it i don't think back then you really thought of careers as such mm. uh it was it was strange how how it did you know continue as long as it did there was there was a time after I came back from the cruise ships i then went on 
uh, I was being freelance assistant, and then also I did a bit of paint and decorating, specialist paint and decorator, rag rolling. Remember nice. rag rolling? No. Oh, is that where Mark, it like, um, yeah, you, stickles yeah. up? You're too young, mate. You're too young. Go on. <laughs> um, rag rolling, uh, marbling. I did all, all of that. So that was sort of like a second sort of like income stream. But I, you know, I, I did enjoy photography. And, uh, and in the, yeah, I just carried on doing it. And it went from small little pack shots to, you know, larger ones as, as your name gets around a bit more. Mm. And, um, and yeah, it just, it just kept on, kept on going. There wasn't a time when I thought, oof, I really need to change this. I don't know. It's probably a bit like an actor, you know, an, an actor, you know, they, they, well, they, you're kind of, you're kind of segueing onto, I was going to interrupt you then and talk about. <laughs> Okay, acting. I didn't mean to. No, I no, I, I was just wait. I was just <laughs> waiting for you a little lull in the conversation. I was going to say, on the topic of second incomes, I kind you of want believe to talk you about have... him, don't you? You want to talk about him? I, well, it's up to you. I, I. Uh... So obviously, okay. So okay, let, yeah, go for it. Uh, most people uh, have a midlife crisis, and yep. uh, they go and uh, you know buy a sports car, whatever. And so that. I didn't have a I I, I didn't uh, have a midlife crisis as such, but I did have a a midlife shift. Definitely, <laughs> um, you, you could definitely say that two thousand and seven, <clears throat> literally down to November two thousand and seven, when when the new new James Bond came out, uh, everybody thought he was going to be rubbish. I don't know if you remember when Daniel Craig was launched. <laughs> Casino. As the new Bond, yep. he couldn't he drive rode. the Aston. He couldn't do all this stuff, and he and he was um, dropped off at Tower Tower Bridge by the uh, Navy, and he had his yep. um, life belt button. on. Yeah, <laughs> do, do you know what? I remember it really quite well, actually. Big but I think hair. Casino, I think Casino Royale is one of the best Bond films ever made. Oh. So when so when it came out, yes, it is. It is in my in my opinion it is. You know the best, the best, the opening scene, the free running, yeah. the parkour running, uh, awesome, awesome film. So anyway, went and saw it, and then um, my wife back then, uh, she said, "Oh, you look a bit like uh, you look a bit like Daniel Craig." I said, oh, "Thank you very much. That's nice. <laughs> it's better than Jaws." <laughs> I that. What's she after? Uh, <laughs> oh, cool. uh, yeah. So uh, she was uh, an entertainer, and she said, "Oh, I think you can make some money out of this. Make some money out of this." So I, I said, oh, "Do you?" She said, "Yeah, yeah." So yeah, I think you could, you know, uh, you could be a lookalike. I haven't really thought of lookalikes back then. So I said, um, "Okay, yeah, fine, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm always game to have a little <laughs> go at something." So I went to uh, uh, I went to Burton's and <laughs> got a uh, a suit. Uh, which wasn't a very great suit. Little clip on bow tie. Uh, yeah. All this. Uh, and, not not um, Savile Row tailor made. Like <laughs> it was not. Himself. It no. was not. No. And I, I, and I took a few, uh, few little pictures and, and sent them off to uh, some lookalike agencies. And, and it was just hitting at the right time because uh, the film came out, and there wasn't any Daniel Craig lookalikes out there because you know nobody had ever heard of them. So uh, when my picture went in, they said, oh, yeah, yeah, we, we, you know, he, he's popular. I subsequently, you know, since then found out that the most popular, go on, what was the most popular lookalike? <clears throat> Have a guess. What do you think the most popular lookalike of all time has been? Of all time? I don't know. I guess... The one that sprung to mind first, I don't know why, is Marilyn Monroe. Very true, very true. I'd say the the number one <clears throat> has been the Queen, Queen lookalike. Okay. Not Freddie Mercury, the actual Queen. Royal families do very well. Uh, Man in one row is definitely um, up there. Uh, but then also uh, Bond. Uh, the Bond theme w- was very good, very popular. The reason why is because lots of companies have um, their events, their balls, their dinners. And everybody's turning up in black ties and yeah. being always dressed up. So easiest way to actually theme an event is, oh, don't come to our summer ball. Come to our 
James Bond, son of all. <laughs> you know, and all they got to do is just throw a few, you know, playing cards on the uh, on the table, yeah. uh, have some uh, martinis uh, on the bar, <clears throat> and then get some lookalikes to actually greet the guests coming in. So, actually, Bond is, is a very popular one. So, so it wasn't so much. Um, I'm not so much a Daniel Craig lookalike. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a James Bond lookalike. You know, okay. and um, so anyway, I sent I sent the pictures off, and uh, yeah, yeah, we got we got some, yeah, we we got some work pretty quick on, and then um, I think probably about two months in, two months in, after I had a, after I had a, because uh, <clears throat> also the the local newspaper, uh, Anglia TV, they sent a reporter down. <laughs> oh yes, you you, you can you can see it already. <laughs> They said it down, an interview came down, and he was dressed up as Q. <laughs> it was so bad. And it was in my studio, and I had Trevor, my assistant, with me. And uh, I, I don't know, he, 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 bought this, uh, he bought this cucumber. Sounds wrong. Yeah. <laughs> he bought his cucumber. And, and uh, I picked it up and said, oh, careful, Bond, that's not a cucumber, that's a bazooka. And... Um, and my and then we it was balanced on this fishing wire. Uh, oh my god! It was anyway. It was yeah, very very bad. So anyway, so uh, within about two months, I got my first uh, proper gig aboard for for Monaco, uh, and I thought, right, you know, I need to actually do it properly now. So what I you actually... went you went to Monaco to the casino, presumably. Oh yeah, as, yeah, yeah. as a Bond lookalike. Oh yeah, yeah. So this was probably about three months after I started doing it. I went to there's a big corporate event in Monaco, and I thought, right, I can't go in my little old uh, Burton suit, you know, with my little, you know, uh, yeah, Mickey Mouse take watch. It, take on. it seriously now. So I got to take it seriously. So I went and uh, I, I got a Jeeves and Hawks uh, uh, suit, seven hundred pounds. Kurt Geiger shoes, uh, bow tie, the full works. Ordered my fake. Amiga Seamaster watch from China, uh, eighty pounds, because <laughs> uh, I couldn't afford a real one. And, and then also, I got a friend um, who was an actor, bless him. He, uh, I said, look, give me some pointers. You know, I, I don't know what to do. You know, I just got to turn up there and just, you know, walk around. What am I going to do? Yeah. So uh, he uh, he gave me uh, some advice. Uh, he saw he had looked at Casino Royale, and he said, right, okay. So when he walks into the room. He he lets the people come to him. Okay, he doesn't go in and say hello. You just you just got to, you know enter the room. You breathe yeah. in, presence, whatever. Control the room, and then yeah. you've got to slightly dominate the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right, yeah. Okay, brooding, domination, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I got there, and uh, they took over this whole hotel, and each each room was themed for a different um, film. And I was uh, in uh, one, uh, I can't remember the film I was in. Anyway, I was standing outside the door, seven o'clock. That's when all the guests were coming in. It was a big corporate event. There was also an odd job there. There's a Jaws there. There was um, Shirley Bassey there. There was Juggies nice. there. I mean, you know. And I can remember I was standing there looking around this gorgeous hotel thing. What, what am I doing here? I haven't got a clue what I'm doing here. I haven't got, not, not a Scooby-Doo. What am I going to do there? So all these people come in there. And I'm, so I'm okay, brooding. You know, control the situation. You know, there's me, my tux, you know, whatever. And um, first person come up to me, where's the cloakroom? Do you know where the cloakroom is? <laughs> Second person, uh, are you serving drinks? <laughs> oh, God, it was. <laughs> oh, oh, God, I think I'm a waiter. Uh, because everybody knows what Sean Connery looks like. You know, yeah. I mean, he is the classic one. Daniel Quay, you know, new boy in the block. He he wasn't he wasn't so well known. So <laughs> that's when I had to sort of like you know, you know, conjure up this uh, this persona, which has taken. It took a few years actually to. I mean, there's another gig I did where you know I turned up 400 people in this in this uh, room. The event organizer saying, "Okay, you've got an hour and a half. Just go in, go in and mingle and just mingle with them all." Yeah, you know, it's just you. And it wasn't it wasn't overly themed as a Bond thing. It was just sort of like a dinner dance, you know. And they just put it. So I went in there, you know, you know, control the situation. Good evening. You're looking very lovely today. And uh, and the woman sort of looked at me. She, she, my husband, my husband's at the bar, <laughs> you know. 
he plays rugby. He's bigger <laughs> than you. I wouldn't say that again. <laughs> oh god. So so then uh it wasn't until I actually it wasn't until I actually uh thought, right, okay, I'm not Steve the photographer mm. pretending to be James Bond, you know. I am James Bond. And then literally, so then it was is when I did that, then I put the coat on, put the check on, whatever, chest puffs out. And then I, I walk and the, the joke is you walk it to a gig and the client is there. The first thing they do to all look alike is they look at you. Yeah. Because they've only seen a photo. Oh, yeah. Oh, you do look like him. Oh, that's good. And uh, second thing, what should I call you? Shall I call you James? Or shall I call you Daniel? <laughs> said, you can call me whatever you want. <laughs> and it, it's bizarre. And, and the, yeah, they just start playing into that little persona. And, um, and, and then that just gives you far more confidence. And uh, beforehand, when I had a gig, it used to be three days before I'd start worrying about it, you know. Yeah. Get up there before I go out onto it. I have to go to the toilet, or whatever. Oh god, because you have to go. You know, you've got to go and host. You know, events. You know, in yeah. front of you know three or four hundred people. You're putting on a like, show, aren't you? You definitely are. Yeah. And the, and the trouble is, uh, if they see a bit of fear, oh, they're in there like jackals. Especially when you're doing when you're walking around uh, yeah. doing meet and greet. You know, and you know you've got some bunch of lads, whatever. You know, your my grandma looks more like fucking Bond than well, you, you don't do. Look, you look nothing like him. Yeah. Right? Uh, yeah, and and that's when you just come back with some witty little one-liners or, or whatever. But you know, so it's been good. So it's been good. And then okay. from that, obviously, you know, the pinnacle of any any lookalike is actually to meet their, you know, alter ego. You know, and I didn't only meet him; I actually managed to uh, somehow appear in in a Bond scene with him. Um, Quantum of Solace. <clears throat> did you? Where, which, you did, which, yeah. Whereabouts? I've seen it a few times. You've you've seen it. Okay, okay you're gonna go back now. It's about it's about eleven and a half minutes in from the start. Okay, okay. so it opens up in um, in uh, Rome when they're doing the horse racing. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. When they go around there, and then yeah. uh, uh, Mister White, he he's escapes. trying to escape. Mm, yeah, uh, go down to the underground tunnels, whatever. Bit of yep. a fight going on. Get there. They capture him. He's in the tunnels uh, underneath there. Uh, M's there. Judy Dench. She's there. Yeah. Say right. You know what's all going Did on. Did you here? meet Judy Dench? You met Judy Dench as well. Nice. She is as lovely as she, as you think she is. I can imagine it. I saw. Yeah. Yeah, I saw Louis Theroux interview her. She came across really well, actually. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. sorry. I digress. <laughs> so, um, so she's in there. Interrogating uh, Mr. Mr. What, and then suddenly uh, Judy Dench's bodyguard, bloody well, turns out to be a double agent. It does, yeah. Bang, 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 whatever. Mr. What escapes. Another little chase down there. Cuts to back in London, rainy scene. Judy Dench is standing on the balcony looking out, you know. Yeah. Taxi pulls up. Uh, Daniel Craig comes out, walks up the stairs, goes into the room. <clears throat> Oh, M says, well, this is a bloody stupid mess you've got me into, whatever. Um, so just as he uh, is walking into the corridor, um, I'm there as an MI5 agent standing there, you know. He walks in. I'll give him a nod. He goes, no, like that. Pinewood, one day's filming. Uh, we was there all day. Uh, <laughs> we, we was there to be Socko people, uh, <clears throat> dressed in white inside the... Um, this is the... I the, the, How did that come about? Were, were you there as an extra? Were you? It was or did all, it was they invite all, you there? No, they didn't invite me. If, if they knew, if they knew, they they don't because. Uh, oh, so it wasn't as a Eon, result Eon, of your Bond stuff. No, no, they. they oh, yeah, okay. Eon don't like lookalikes. <laughs> they they like to protect their brand. Very, <laughs> you know, very careful. No, I got there because obviously when um, uh, Quantum of Solace came out. Uh, no, Casino Royale came out. We looked to see who did the casting, Mad Dog yeah. casting, connected with them, got onto their books, uh, did a couple of uh, shows with them or, or things with them. One of them was some spooks. Uh, and then and then they said, um, oh, we, we've got um, a couple of days filming in Pinewood. Would you be up for it? Definitely went there. And um, did you know it was Bond to... before? We knew it was Bond. Okay. Because for... Um, 
Quantum of Solace, a, a lot of the film was done abroad. They only filmed a, a small amount actually in Pinewood. So there's only okay. a, a few days actually um, filming there. So uh, got along there. Should have been they had ten Socko guys um, in the apartment, which was the which was the uh, Judy Dench's bodyguards or like double agent. Mm. Um, she was in there trying to find you know, what the problem was. So yeah. the, the Socko guys should have been sort of like you know checking for the this and fingerprints and, and finding that. But they had somebody on on set saying, well, I don't know why they've got 10 people in there because they'd only have have two in there. They wouldn't have 10 people tramping around in there. So I don't know what you're going to do. So initially it was all fun, exciting. Oh, look at this, bright lights, all that. And then, you know, lunchtime came, food was quite nice. And then I'm getting bored now. <laughs> in came Judy Dent. She was lovely. She was very, very chatty. Funny thing is a lot of extras for... Uh, a lot of extras are um, first class cabin stewards. Really? <laughs> Which I didn't I, I, know. That's not what I thought you were going to say. Okay. <laughs> the first class long haul cabin stewards because they sort of like usually do like a week on, week off or two weeks, two on, off. You okay. know, they, they fly out of Heathrow. So they sort of like are based around there. So they have this free time. They know their schedules. So they put themselves down for um, extra work. And at least three of the extras on, on the shoot that day were actually uh, British Airways, of course, uh, cabin uh, stewards, whatever. So anyway, I think one of them had actually met Judy Dench actually on, on a flight, whatever. Okay. And he's got his son chatting. He said, oh, you know, my cousin, he's your dentist. Oh, yes, I do. She was lovely. Um, Daniel Craig uh, was, I think he was in, in the row, in the zone. Method acting, was he? Yeah, so he just, you know... Did he not double-take you and go, I just think he was looking right. in the mirror? So anyway, so, so the day came. By the, by the end of the day, oh, it's all getting bored. Getting bored. Oh, I've got two days of this. Oh, God, I can't. You know, it fa- it's funny how it's, you know, it does, you know, the enthusiasm does wane a bit. So anyway, we've mm. got 7 o'clock, <clears throat> last shot of the day. Bearing in mind, I don't know if you know a film set, you know, they take hours to do anything. They shoot right. it one way, then they shoot it the other way, then they shoot the reverse, and all this just takes bloody hours, whatever. Anyway, last shot came up. They, they said, right, we need uh, we need um, two more people, okay, to be uh, bodyguards. Who can do that? So I do, I do, you know, okay, baby, you and you, yeah. um, me and first class cabin steward, whatever. <laughs> and and they said, right, okay, so you got to be, um, you've got to be uh, MI MI five agent. So we need you in a suit. We was only in jeans and a t-shirt because we were just going to be wearing the the Socko boilers outfits. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, so Matey went and literally grabbed this jacket off somebody, uh, slung it on, and said, well, "I'm here, I'm ready, always ready." Uh, I thought, oh, great, he's got in there first, you know. In the meantime, wardrobe was running off to get me some clothes to come back. So the uh, second director said, "Yeah, okay, so you just go down there." Wardrobe comes in there. Quick, quick, quick! We haven't got the time. You know, looking at it, oh, quick, I've got to get this shot done quickly. Okay, okay. So, get changed now. So, I got changed in the middle of this set, whatever. Uh, off to try and put the jack on. Okay, no, no shoes. Oh, I haven't got time for shoes. Oh. <laughs> so, so, okay, right. so just stand there. It was all. I mean, all day it had taken friggin' hours just to shoot one bloody scene, and now yeah. it was like the rush of whatever. Quick, quick, quick. So, um, so okay. So the first chap. He was at the end of the corridor, and they said, "What well, you stand there. And uh, so I'm standing there. And I've done a bit of film work before, actually. Uh, I've been in um, The Chief, uh, Tales of the Expected, all the classics okay. there, back in the yeah. Love Joy, back in the day. Love Joy. <laughs> oh, God. Image. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, I was standing by the door, and I could see the camera was actually here. I thought, okay, well, this is quite a good shot, this camera here. Uh, and the poor bugger, he was down the other end of the corridor behind the door which was closed i thought oh yeah sucker <laughs> <Camera's> <laughs> here. you're not gonna be seen you're not gonna be seen so uh so anyway so um right okay ready. it's all rushed literally five ten minutes from we need two people he's now shooting it camera's here okay we're going for a take um so in comes uh daddy Craig, bashes in through the front door or through the side door walks up the corridor looks at me walks into the uh, room and uh, I'm just standing there and uh, okay cut that was good we'll go for, we'll go for another one go for another take okay so he comes out looks at me looks down see I haven't got any shoes on 
you know, I'm just there in my socks. So he said, are you some sort of a ninja agent? I go, oh, yeah. Okay. I was still playing it cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He then goes off. Okay, right, fine. Uh, the camera's still here. You know, I'm waiting for them to do the reverse shot or whatever. The camera's still there. Yeah. So, so then, okay, action, take two. He comes up, gets halfway up there. And the camera going, oh, no, I'm not ready. Sorry, sorry, cut. I'm not ready. Sorry. Yeah, I wasn't ready for that. I must admit, the look Daniel Gray gave the director, well, God, I'm, I'm surprised he wasn't turned to stone. I mean, he was like, really? Really? <laughs> okay. Uh, so we go again, go down there. Third time, comes up there, bash to the door, stomps up there, walks in there. Boom, boom, that's it. Cut, that's it. Uh and that was it. That, that was it. They didn't do literally 20 minutes from them saying it to there. That was a the shot they got. They didn't do any reverse thing. I was like, okay, that was it. So I was quite happy. And then it wasn't until oh, six months later when the film came out, um, I had an agent went and saw the preview of it. And he said, the film, eh, it's all right. He said, but um, he said, your bit was quite good. <laughs> I said, well, that's it. He said, oh, yeah, that's a good shot of you in there. And then when the film came out, I had people saying, was that you? Was that you in the James Bond film? I said, yeah. yeah, it was, yeah. And I've got this little shot of me, him, yeah. So, so I'd like to say it was uh, a little cameo that the director thought, yeah, you know, we'll put that in there a little. But I don't know. Hey, but uh, you know, let him. What can I, I say? Mean, oh, what can I say? It's yeah. a great story. I've I've dined on that for for what I think ten years now. <laughs> Yeah, I bet. <laughs> am, am I right in thinking there's there's a YouTube video knocking around that's James Bond related? So, it's done done a little bit. So, Some might say okay. Uh, so uh, obviously, you know, uh, about five years as a uh, no, about three years I was doing you know Bond lookalike. It was, it was all fine. Can, can, can I just interrupt quickly and tell me to my own business if you don't want to tell me? I'm really curious what a lookalike earns for being a lookalike. So, I mean, I look at like, on average, sort of like 500, 600 pounds for a gig, which is about three hours work. Wow. That's like that. Yeah. I had one gig. I had one gig in um, South Africa where uh, where they came to me direct, because normally they're through agents, whatever. So they yeah. came to me direct and they said, right, we, we're, we're filming this commercial out in South Africa. You know, we, we've seen your picture. We really want you to do it. You know, uh, can you... Uh, you know, are you free? It's gonna be like you know, four days filming out there, whatever. I thought, right, yeah. this is this is it. This is this was probably I don't know when was it? Uh, two thousand seventeen, probably two thousand seventeen. Okay. Right. And they said, you know, can you come out there? And I thought, wow, this is it. This is this is the one. You know, the break. This this is the yeah. So I said, okay, so uh, yeah, so it's gonna be uh, seventeen thousand pounds to fly me out there. I need to go business class, and I want a holiday at the end of it. Because if I'm going to fly all that way, I want to enjoy it. <laughs> I say yes. So they said, okay, so uh, we can do the holiday offer. That's no problem at all. Um, uh, the price is okay. Yeah, we can do that. But but business class, do you mind? Do you mind if you if you would, you know, fly freight? And I thought, fuck, mate, I'll go by rickshaw. They paid you 17K <laughs> to go to South Africa. <laughs> I mean, you couldn't believe when that email <laughs> came in. So I went there, uh, and then I found out they actually got me over there three days beforehand, just because if I wasn't there, you know, obviously the, the shoot couldn't go ahead. So yeah. she got me over there earlier. Had my own personal um, chauffeur. They was making two tuxes for me. They had their own, made two tuxes for me, whatever, out there. And then they said, okay, we're doing this... Um, we're doing this uh, tying with um mercedes for the car that you're going to be driving can you um you know can you do this day's photo shoot by this car i said yeah i said okay i can do that he said yeah uh we know we haven't actually you know this is over and above what you do so is it okay you know would you do it for another two grand i said <laughs> go on then <laughs> in the shot i had to hand the keys so they flew in this like Freaking Nicky Clark hairdresser to cut my hair, and he did three snips, took a selfie, and that was it. And then I had to hand over the car keys to somebody. Uh, oh no, 
my hands weren't good enough, so they had a hand model. Got a hand model, especially just for this shot. <laughs> um, and then on the actual shoot, when we actually came to the, the shoot, I mean, I mean, there must have been 25, 25 crew there. I mean, this director there was really, you know, a, a well-known director doing this shoot. The, the the chap from the advertising agency, he um, he was always, uh, he was well-known for doing, you know, uh, adverts that made a bit of a reaction or whatever. Yeah. And the whole thing was just based on, in South Africa, you don't, you, they, they don't do, um, you don't get points on your license. They don't come and put points in license, so because of that, people drive you know very fast and you know, they don't really take much in consideration. So right. what they were trying to do was actually, if you drive more sensibly, um, your insurance would be cheaper. So you'd have like this little black box in your car. So much over here now with you know new drivers or whatever, little black box in there. And um, so basically, I was just sort of like driving, driving slowly. <laughs> so that was the plan of it. <clears throat> Got over there, uh, about three or four other actors. Uh, I wasn't allowed to drive the car, so I had my own double stunt driver to drive it literally five miles an hour, whatever. Right. Uh, the director, or not the director, the, the chap put it on and said, oh, I don't like his hair. I don't like his hair. No, no, it's not, it's not right. <laughs> they might have just cut three days ago. No, 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 we need it to sort it out. We need it to sort it out. You know, he's going to my hairdresser. Um, if he comes back to the hotel because it was about an hour's drive to actually get to the set from the hotel. You had to be on the set early in the morning. I said, hey, we need... She, so the, the woman in charge of it, she said, well, we need their person in the morning. Uh, he said, I'll tell you what, um, get his hair cut at my hotel, and then we can just get a helicopter and just fly. <laughs> <As you do. laughs> she said, no, Jim. You know, <laughs> The budget is already out of hand. We can't do that. We'll get another photographer. We'll drive Matt out on set. So I had my hair cut again. And then I got in the car <laughs> and uh, I just, you know, so he said, okay, now just <clears throat> look in the rear view mirror, look moody, whatever. So the, the chap put it on. He was well happy. He took a picture of me in the car, sent it back to his mate in London, saying, oh, look who I've got over here. Wow, Daniel Cray. I thought, really? <laughs> 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 so we did all this there. And then the, the, the video comes out and I'm in it for, Three seconds. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and then the joke was six weeks after it came out, it got banned. Eon, the company obviously owned James oh, they Bond. Shut it down, did they? Got said, to leave no, the team it's, up. It, it's far too close. Uh, uh, but that, that's, a co- that's a compliment. <laughs> that's a very good compliment. But the client was actually happy because obviously, when anything gets banned, it's sort of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and all this, yeah. So that was that was that was a that was a cracking gig. And then after that, because we were that was in Johannesburg, and then yeah, I flew to Cape Town for four days, five days, had a little holiday there. Cracking job. That's, that's an unbelievable story. Yeah, <laughs> I've 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 had some I've had some good gigs where you just you know money wouldn't get you in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I, it's, I, it's been fun. I'm glad I interrupted because that was a first class story. <laughs> but I, we, we, you were just about to talk about YouTube. Okay, YouTube. Yeah, so so been doing the bond that's all fine you know you, i just meet basically uh you know odd job jewels maybe the queen uh something like that uh you know it'd be nice to work with some other lookalikes and then i was in asda i was near the pasta my phone went looked at the phone david beckham rang me up in the phone david beckham oh well he wasn't david beckham he's a david beckham lookalike you know uh hello andy uh, oh, hello steve because he actually talks like david beckham hello steve he said, uh, I'm putting together an act for Britain's Got Talent, you know, and best of British, you know, I'd like you to be in it. Would you like to be in it? I said, yeah, fine. No problem. So that started, that started uh, the, the Chip and Doubles, the Chip and Doubles, which he put together. Uh, we went on BGT 2010. It was, oh, did you? It was me, uh, Mr. T, Will Smith, Simon Cow, Gordon Ramsay and Ricky Gervais. Um, people go, oh, Chip and Dar, I don't remember the Chip and Doubles. I said, okay, remember the group of blokes who walked on all dressed as monks with white masks on, all dressed as monks on there to this Gregorian chanting music, walked on there, and then it turned around, and the first one was Ricky DeVos. He ripped his masks off there, and he went into the old dance. Uh, and then 
we all did it, all that. Oh yeah, I remember that. That that video is now clocked up 61, 62 million views of our. Uh, of our... You'll have to, you'll have to share the six. So how many? Sixty one or sixty two million views. Oh my gosh! I know. Yeah, and we don't see a penny of it. <laughs> no, of course not. <laughs> Simon Cow does though. <laughs> it does it? Is this? Oh, it's on their channel, is it? Oh yes, Psycho, Psycho Productions, whatever. Yeah, yeah, and and so that was back then. And since then, uh, I met up with the guys sort of like uh, two weeks ago. We we kept in touch. You know, we did quite a few gigs afterwards. Uh, oh, it was, it was great fun. It was it really. Oh, you last. You'll have Great to send fun. me a link to it, and yeah. I'll, uh, I'll make sure to put it in the show notes so people can check yeah. it out. Yeah, well, well, I mean, if if you watch B, BGT, I'd say it's in one of the top, it's definitely in the top 10 auditions. Is it? Okay. Just behind Susan Boyle. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> Obviously. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, so, you know, that, that, that's been really, you know, been a lookalike. It has actually, you know, been a lot of fun and earned, you know, a bit of money as well. But people always say, so Steve, I thought you was a photographer, but obviously now you're Daniel Craig, you know, look at us. No, nah, no. Nah. If, if I was a full-time Daniel Craig lookalike, <clears throat> I, I, I'd be, you know, no. Nah. Well, he's, re- he's retired now, isn't he? So effectively, I guess you have as well. Yeah. 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 Although, although, although I have, I had an inquiry come in uh, yesterday, actually, to host an event. I said, okay, host an event, whatever at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Oh, nice. Uh, so I'm now thinking, well, you know, if you want me, you're going to have to pay for me. Because <laughs> <laughs> if it comes in, fine. But, I mean, if, if I've got to stand up in front of, you know, a thousand people, whatever, and and mangle something that they've written, I won't get paid it, for it. Here's a weird question, then. So... I guess obviously this podcast was initially about photography, but I'm so enthralled with your stories that I'm uh, <laughs> I'm changing tack. Have you been able to leverage your lookalike work towards your photography? I'm not talking. Th- I'm not talking about anything such as you know handing out business cards on the sly, or, or maybe you do. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> is that have you been able to do anything with that? I don't think so much um, leveraging in that way but definitely the photography and the lookalike work ha- have gone hand in hand with each other initially okay. when i started doing it obviously i get photographed a lot by yeah. um people uh photographers and i know what that photographer is looking for you know there's lots of group shots so i'm very good at getting people in the right get nice and close in there you know me in the center focal point whatever yeah. so it worked very well from from that point of view actually you know being able to uh you know set the shot up for the photographer to get a good shot um okay. but then also the other way around is that i was always reasonably outgoing but being bond you just you just got it's all in you just can't you can't you know stand at the back of the room and just you know yeah. pretend you're a statue you've got to get in there and get meet meet and greet with them so that has actually you know made you know a little bit from before as a photographer, I was used to that, but really in Bond, you've just got to go in full, full, full force now, you know. Yeah. So now when I go in to photograph, you know, wherever, I just treat it, treat it a bit like a, a gig, whatever, go in there. I don't say, hi, my name's Bond, James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I say, hi, my name's Steve. Steve. Uh, no, just, just go in there and it, it just gives you, it's, I suppose, it's the confidence, the confidence yeah. giving you. And uh, yeah. And, yeah, so so that's the, the the way it has worked. You know, okay. I haven't done a gig as Bond and then you know gone back and say, "Well, do you want me to do the?" You know. Sometimes people have actually asked me, "Can you do Bond and can you also you take the picture at the same time?" I said, "Come on, <laughs> it's one Daniel or the other." Craig. You, Daniel you, Craig you, you would not be pick. doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Fuck. So it, it, it it's fine. So it's now sort of like coming coming to the end now. A few more gigs maybe before they you know get the new one in. Um, yeah, but yeah, you know, it, it's been a very nice little sideline hustle. Okay, okay, I'm going to move on now because otherwise I'll have you here all morning listening to uh, your your stories, of which I imagine you have a few. Have you got any good? Fo- <laughs> have you got any good photography related stories? Good photography related stories. Uh, oh dear, um, I should have probably thought about that one. Probably... What's, the, what, what's the 500 portraits in 90 minutes? 
so that was going back to the time on the cruise ships on the cruise okay. ships i had to photograph obviously first and second sitting dinner. oh i see okay yeah, yeah so and literally you had to you know i mean what's worse than having a picture taken having a picture taken while you're, you're eating, eating. <laughs> yeah. and you had to go around there and i used to i it was on the um captain's uh, farewell dinner right and i'm dressed in a tux and literally every time i came out of that dinner hall uh the tux was absolutely dripping it was yeah. it was it was a very <clears throat> it was a stressful because we you walk up when you walk up the stairs to go into the dining room you can just hear that you know as you go up the stairs that noise you know, yeah. getting louder and louder and then you open the door and it just comes out and there's you think oh god there's another 500 people in there none of them want their picture being taken but if i don't take it you know i'm not gonna get paid so yeah you just take a big drive to, in there and you just go bang 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 quick as you can onto the next one <laughs> you um you mentioned in your linkedin i saw you put on linkedin about being flown to new york to take a picture of a sandwich is that did i read that right you did, yes. So one of the clients is uh, Pret, Pret and Monje. So okay. I do a lot of, the majority of photography I did for them was of their staff and their people, um, okay. as well as some of their sandwiches. And obviously, Pret is now global. Yeah. So they did want a uh, some photos taken out in, in America. And they, you know, they got a photographer out there to, to take the pictures. But with with photographers, you very much have your own style and right. your own feel. And also with brands, brands have their own style and feel as well. And it just worked out. It was easier to actually fly me out there for me to go out there and photograph their staff, their people, their sandwiches. For a consistency basis. For consistency. For consistency. Yeah. And also the other thing is it, it was easier for them because I got out there <laughs> and they said, okay, here's a list of, here's a list of the places. Here's the, 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 the metro map. Go out and do it yourself. So I was going around Grand Central Station. I was going all over the places there uh, doing it. And then we went to uh, so we had New York, Washington, Chicago. Uh, yeah, I think we went out there two or three times to actually do it. And, yeah. and one of the posts I'm, I'm going to do on LinkedIn is literally have two pictures next door to each other, you know, yeah. and for you to pick which one was shot in New York and which one was shot in newark um, <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully because obviously the shops are very similar the, yeah. the outfit is similar hopefully you shouldn't really be able to tell the difference because it's got that same style feel look to it mm. uh, which is which is you know what they were looking for here's one for you i'm gonna i'm gonna bring this back to photography how and I, i'm gonna change the questions a little bit because I feel like some of them probably aren't quite as relevant. But I think one that would be really interesting to know for any aspiring photographers that are uh, watching or listening to this, how does one get a company like pret a as a client? So pret a as a client uh, came through um, a relationship I had with the um, uh, agency. Uh, one of their agencies was in Norwich, <coughs> where okay. I was as a photographer. Uh, it was a big dog agency and I was doing some photography for them anyway. And one of their clients was pret and and they needed some shots taken for them. And the creative director there, um, James Cannell said, uh, can you, can you do these shots? Can you do the shots? And they worked out fine. I carried on doing, you know, different um, either product shots or some uh, event shots. And then there came a time when actually um, James went over from, you know, he went from um, agency side over to client side. And he actually became mm. the uh, creative director of pret a okay. He ended up being a global, Pret, you know, head of creative or whatever. Nice. Uh, and uh, and the, the nice thing, which I'm very grateful for, is uh, obviously going over there you know, into London, he could have picked anybody, any, you know, pick up the phone, you know, open the window, shout, is a photographer there? And I'm sure six people would say, yes, here I am. Uh, yeah. But he didn't. He he said, no, you know, we, we've done a good job over here. Can you, you know, come and do the, um, you know, some, some work for, for us there? So that's what I, that's what I did. So basically that was relationships, obviously. It was, it was very much, you know, which I think a lot of people, you, you speak to a lot of people, uh, LinkedIn, 
gurus, experts, whatever. <clears throat> mm. They say it's all about the relationships, building the relationships. You know, you're not just going to um, do a, uh, a picture sent to print and say, hey, well, can I, you know, now be your photographer? Yeah. I think a different thing is, though, though, that is where where now is that you can, uh, a would-be photographer can take a picture and can post it on their social media channel, yep. being, um, being that LinkedIn or Instagram or whatever, and now they can actually tag in Predamonje. They can tag in different companies or clients that they would like to work for. Yeah. And there is a possibility that, you know, their photo, because they've shot something a bit different, a bit unique, they have their own yep. sort of style, uh, there is a much easier way of getting your image in front of, you know, the company. And then there is a possibility, um, if they've seen that, you can then use that as a way to build a relationship. And then if the actual company does actually, you know, you know, like your picture, tweet the picture, whatever, and then yeah. there is like an inroads inroads there. So so that's that's a that's another way of actually doing it, or just coming up with a style uh that you uh are, are passionate about and, and want to photograph in this particular style, be that people, buildings, whatever it is. Yeah. And then trying to get that picture out there. I mean, when I started, it was very much walking around with a portfolio in, in a case and knocking yeah. on doors and showing people. Now it's just, you know, that is, then it became websites, but but now it's more social media and it's just getting, you know, it's getting the eyes on there. But troubles where before in Norwich. It's gone you know, the other it, way though, hasn't it? Now where discoverability was tough, but it's gone the other way now where a thousand people will tag prep in a sandwich of their a picture of their BLT sandwich, and it's like, well, okay, mm -hmm. how do you how do you stand out, right? I think it's very tricky. I mean, I mean, people starting out, uh, if they want to get some, you know, uh, commercial work in in their portfolios, I always say, if there is a charity that is very close to your heart, whatever, mm. that either you donate to or or you you really have some connection with them. Uh, try and find a, a local uh, outlet for that charity and see if you can actually, you know, help them with some some photography. Uh, if it, it could just be photographing, say, Matt Millens, it could be photographing their coffee morning or whatever, or something like that. Yeah. But at least then, rather than just taking a picture of somebody, you know, having a, you know, a generic coffee morning, you can now actually say, actually, this was a job I did for, you know, Matt Millens' coffee morning. And yeah. you know that it, you know if the pictures are good, they might use it, uh, and then that is a way of actually you know gaining some recognition there. I think you've probably got to be quite more focused in actually what type of photography you want to do. Whereas before, I would say I, I'm a GP type photographer, general purpose photographer, and that is yeah. what I've covered all my life. Um, now I'm probably focused a bit more on people, um, but I think you need to be quite you know sure on where you're skills are and also pick a pick a field or niche that actually has that uses photography on a regular basis so, so is, that, is that what you would tell someone if they came up to you and said they wanted to take up photography i think so yes but i mean i think photography you can definitely have it as a as a you know that lovely phrase a size hustle for a while mm. to start off with you don't need to go you know all in it's not as you're just going to be opening a you know a camera shop you know in the yeah. high street and say well i'm ready for portraits there's lots you can do um as you know in, in the weekends or you know one day a week to actually you know build up your portfolio or confidence your contacts and yeah. if you can do that in line with another job as i said when i started it was um painting and decorating that's what paid the the bills <clears throat> yeah. then and then the photography you know you have that ticking along until you actually do you know feel that you can actually you know survive just by being a photographer which is very hard you know it's not easy <laughs> it, you know everybody but, says i think any job anybody says is easy you know no yeah like, yeah even now after 35 years i still i'm actively out there looking for new clients finding new things you know, I, I, you, you could sit back in your laurels. I mean, I've got some lovely regular clients that, you know, yeah. it's all fine. But I think that's the thing with photography. Um, 
I wouldn't say uh, I've reached my. I think uh, if I took a picture ten years ago, if I took a picture of something, this cup, I should say that cup, you know, every mm. year for ten years, you probably get ten different pictures of the, of the cup because you're just developing your style. You can shoot it differently, yeah. you know, and, and that's a good thing with photography. You know, I look at a picture and I always think I can do better. You know, oh, I could have done this, I could have done that. You never reach perfection with um, photography. You, you, there's always room for improvement. And I think that's what has kept me going for 35 years. Because if you're okay. just in a job and the first day you, you, you cracked it and then you're just doing exactly the same thing day in, day out for the next 35 years, that it's just boring, gets that, very it? boring. It's, yeah. it's very good to try and always have something that keeps pushing it. And and even though you think, yes, that is a great picture that is taken, you think, actually, I could photograph that completely different. I could turn it on its head and photograph it, you know, a completely different way rather than the way I have photographed it. Are, are you worried about the, the tech and the AI influences on photography? I think that's definitely, I think it's definitely, um, you know, it's a bit of a, game changer that's come along especially with all these uh you know generated images beforehand yeah. uh, it was never i mean when digital photography came out you thought oh that's the end of photography um it hasn't though it's still it's still going on photography um i suppose there's a certain you know level of product shots that you know uh, are done by other people now far easier yeah but it's still photographing say people um, still needs, you know, somebody there to do it until now, because obviously with the AI, I mean, it's the thing I, I just heard on the radio about some of these records being pulled down because they've had, um, uh, what was one, one band used AI to uh, put a, a Liam Gallagher style voice onto their record and yeah. listen to the record. It sounded like him and it wasn't. <laughs> And there's another one called, uh, wasn't it Drake and some Drake and the Weekends? They've had yeah. a, a, a record taken down because their vocals were sampled and then remixed into another, you know. So it's very interesting, but I don't know. All these things that comes along, you know, it's just another hurdle you have to, you know, get over. But not, but not terminal. Hopefully not. There's you just different way. I don't know. Yeah. Evolution, right? A exactly. Evolution. Yeah. I know you've been doing this a long time, but I'm sure there's still things that you find tough or struggle with when it comes to photography. Am I right? I don't know. I suppose anything outside your own comfort zone, you know, that could be a case, but then most people mm. don't sort of like step outside of their comfort zones. Uh, I don't know. I, I, all the photography I, I do, I sort of like enjoy. Um, it's, it's not, you know, yeah, no, I'm reasonably, I, I'm, I'm happy to have a, have a go at anything. I mean, right. crack at anything, you know. But also, I'm quite. I think I think one of the things being a photographer so long is you know all the pitfalls that can happen on that yeah. shoot. If I'm photographing ice cream, you know, let's just say if 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 the room is too hot, it's going to you know not going to turn out well or something. You, you know, there's different ways of yeah. There, there's lots of things you learn by mistakes that you made along the way. So as I've made lots of mistakes, I've obviously learned bucket loads of uh, knowledge. And for that, going forward, you just know, right, this could be a bit iffy here. So I'll do it this way. How about the sort of ever-changing landscape of photography? How, how do you navigate that? Like, do you, when you see new tech coming out or new software or new whatever, how do you sort of deal with it from a perspective of either A, deciding it's a bandwagon worth jumping on or, or ignoring or if it is something that you think, oh, do you know what? I need to pay a little bit more attention to this, then upskilling yourself to say a level where you can actually use something. Because I guess of a career of 35 years, I'm sure you've seen, especially in photography, right? I'm sure you've seen quite a few landscape changes that you've had to decide, you know, whether it's worth getting involved with or, or not. I think, I think, um, has it changed a lot? Yes. I mean, back here in, in, you know, 35 years ago when I started it, if we went into a, a factory, we had to photograph a factory, let's just say, uh, mm. you would say, right, you know, in today we can do 
eight or ten pictures. Picture of the reception, picture of the MD in his office, picture of this or whatever. Right, for that one, yeah. okay, we need to get the lights in. We need to check, see if there's any fluorescence up there. You know, do it over, do a Polaroid, check it, okay, right, one, two, three, click, take it. We'll take two or three pictures, but we're only going to use one. Go on yeah. there, lug around, you know, all this kit, you know, <laughs> tripod, lights, this, that, put brollies up there. It was yeah. a very time consuming thing to actually do it all. And at the end of the day, they would have got. Uh, eight to ten pictures uh, shot on a tripod, um, perfectly lit. You know, looking yeah. all a little bit too, you know, you know, perfect. I, I remember, you know, especially when digital started to come in, the styles started to change. And you know, initially looking at the pictures, you think, oh god, that wasn't shot on a five four camera. That just hasn't got the clarity. It hasn't got the depth of, hasn't got the dy- dynamic range. Especially in sort of like um, Sunday magazines. That's one thing you, you noticed it. They used to have lots of very lush pictures in. Uh, you yeah. look at it, you go, oh, that looks lovely. And then you could just see there is shot, you know, not on five four, shot on thirty five mil or, 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 or different things or different techniques. Um, bokeh where you know the, the background's nice out of focus I mean that's sort of like something that's coming a lot more um, mm. A because it's quite you know stylish but then again also because it was just the way um, you know people were going to, to, to get more interesting pictures so and then with digital you you know everything the ISO of the cameras are much faster so you don't need bigger lights so it's a lot quicker you can got the color balance on the camera. So in that day of the factory where you're shooting eight pictures, you can now shoot 80 pictures, you know, mm. and they won't get 10 pictures. They'll get, uh, you know, 50 pictures they can use. And each one's got a different style. I think it's given a lot more freedom um, going digital um, to experiment different ways. But how, how about something like, I mean, Adobe Lightroom you mentioned earlier. Oh, like I, I've, I've yeah. looked at Lightroom. I just remember turning it on and thinking, oh, my God, it's just totally out of my depth. I mean, that uh, lately, that's come on so leaps and bounds now. I mean, mm. uh, the latest thing now is uh, you can go on there and you can you do a landscape. Um, and the sky, if you haven't filtered for it, whatever, is usually going to be sort of like overexposed, maybe a bit bleached out. You can yeah. now go on there, you just click on a button, select sky, select <laughs> skies. It makes its own layer. You can go in there and, wow. and tweak that, select subject. I mean, yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah, they really have, you know. The big thing with that, I can remember the big hoo-ha was when they actually um, changed from the, you know, you just buy it outright to their subscription service. Yeah. And everybody used to moan about that. But um, to be fair, it is, it is worth, worth what it is. Uh, what it can do now uh, but then look you know everybody you know when you know what to do um all these buttons you have to press and tweak you know it, it, it yeah. becomes second nature there's still other people who i see what they do on on light rooms and i go well i couldn't do that you know mm. there's you know it depends how far like you Pete, take peter it. mckinnon do you, ever, do you ever watch any of his videos yes yeah yeah uh yeah he's he's very yeah very watchable he really has he is, sort of yeah. like crafted his uh his, everything about it but then you'd say you know is it is it him or is of you know are you having if you get into photograph something is it because you want a good picture of that or is it because you want it because he's photographed it i mean he's become yeah. such a personality i mean millions of views on his uh on his videos and they're very engaging yeah. aren't they that's the thing no he's, he's very, very good. engaging he is. yeah ticks all the boxes okay so talking of uh pro photographers if you could shadow one photographer for the day, could oh, be anyone, oh, who would it be? Oh, I'm, I'm not, to be fair, I'm not really into all my, you know, photographers as such. I suppose the only, the only, the only photography print that, you know, I've had for the longest is, is one from um, Ansel Adams, uh, classic uh, photographer, um, sort of like from the last century. Uh and the way he actually, I think, um, rather nowadays, you, you go around, I mean, he shot a lot in Yosemite Park. You go around there, you, you walk around there, you, you, you know, spend all day, you come back with 100 pictures. Mm. He'd walk around there and then he'd walk around there and, he, and he'd find the one picture that he wanted to take. And yep. he would just take literally, you know, one picture of it. Uh, but in his mind's eye also, he knew what he wanted it to look like. 
so he developed um, he developed the uh, zonal um, technique of actually taking exposures from a uh, from a from a picture, and he rather than just taking what he saw, he actually took a picture uh, of what he imagined. And I mean, yeah, his photography is is wonderful. You know, he just he just yeah. frames it perfectly. So. So for that, yeah. I mean, there are other photographers that, you know, it's just, it's, it's, I think with photographers, the one good thing when I was an assistant is you can actually literally shadow a photographer and just see all the little techniques, their tricks of the trades. That's, yeah. that's what it is. It's all those little, those little hacks that they do that I just, you know, bespoke to them because that's just yeah. how they do it. Uh, do, you have, yeah. do you ever have anyone shadowing you? I not really know who wants to shadow me. Girl. I've got Trevor. Okay. Trevor, who uh, who he came uh, for work experience, literally, I don't know, twenty five years ago, twenty eight years ago. <laughs> it was a long time still ago. Still working together now, and um, he is uh, he is uh, a videographer and photographer in his own right. But uh, we do get together on on uh, occasions, and uh, yeah. Uh, apart from that, apart from that, no, I'm just more hands on, you know. Because if you've got to tell mm-hmm. people, oh, can you just move that, like, you know, if you're going to have an assistant, it's good to have an assistant for a long time so they literally know exactly what you want before you actually ask for it. That's a sign yeah. of an assistant, but that mm-hmm. takes time to actually learn how to to do that. So you know, if you if you if I was working, you know, five days a week, you know. Uh, week in week out that's a different thing but photographers are very sort of like uh as i said peaks and troughs yeah so, so for me i mean you know people say oh, you, you know if i if i can if I, I i average two to three days a week photography if i get that i'm more than happy you know but then sometimes yeah. i have a very busy week and then sometimes i have a very busy or quiet month you just you, yeah. ne- you never know exactly how it's going to go um, oh, I understand. Yeah, because also the job that is the phone could literally ring, and then you know somebody ring up and say, "Oh, Steve, we've got this job in. Can you, you know, you know, go down to Cardiff and photograph, you know, something down there, yeah. which I had the other week, which I could oh, did you? Yeah, I couldn't do that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fair enough. Last question for you then: If we spoke again in twelve months' time, and you said to me, Chris, it's been a really good year, what would have happened? Ah, oh, it's been a really good year. I Bizarrely enough, uh, last year uh, when I did my accounts, because I don't really keep track on it. You know, some people keep track on everything, whatever. Yeah. You know, I didn't until until the accountant comes back and send me the figures. And probably last year was, was probably my my best year for probably I don't know fifteen years. Oh, cool. And and I couldn't actually really, <laughs> I couldn't really work out reason why. Um, it was just the case that it was like a perfect storm where I got all these clients I've had over many years and some new ones and they all came together at the same time and yeah. wanting photography. And it was just, it was just ticking over, you know, maybe, you know, three days a week, whatever, you know, okay. And, and it worked really well. Uh, lucky that photography, there is a, a, a lot of um, latitude in, in, in the time, you know, it's not as though I, I need to, you know, work, you know, five days a week whatever it just yeah. just the way it works out for that so um so yeah so uh, hey a good year i'd be working four days a week More. okay you know but then on the on, on interesting projects as well you know yeah okay i'm gonna ask you one last bonus question because because you're you why well, because i can <laughs> um b because your linkedin post has, has piqued my curiosity and i feel like we've covered most of your stories that you mentioned what i am incredibly curious about the cruise ship crashing into the dock story <laughs> so it was on this uh this uh cruise ship called uh the atlas atlas as i said it's converted um or 1955 merchant ship it was on there been we'd been on there about six months i think all on about six months doing three and four day cruising around rose creek patmos every now and again we used to go up the bosphorus to uh, istanbul and by the time you get to six months on a cruise ship, you know, and also on a cruise ship, you know, you work in, you know, seven days a week. It's not just, you know, get a weekend off. It's literally all the time. Yeah. 
And we're talking, oh, God, oh, you're all just thinking, oh, I'll go home and have a roast dinner or whatever, something like that, you know, all getting there. So um, so we was on the, uh, so I think we we're just coming into roads. We was coming into roads. I've got two stories, actually. We're coming to roads. And there was this, it wasn't an almighty bang. No, it wasn't. It wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like anything out of the Titanic, but there was definitely a, <laughs> There was definitely a bang. Okay, there was definitely right. there was definitely a, there was a jolt. It was, a, it was definitely a bang. And then when we came down um, down the camp, presumably, presumably there was lots of passengers on board as well. Oh yeah, just... loads of passengers on board. Yeah, yeah loads of passengers on board. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the lifeboats didn't, you know, didn't come out. It wasn't it wasn't that bad. Uh, so anyway, we uh, we came out, uh, walked down the gangplank, was going to shore, and then by then they had this. Um, a raft like in the water uh with these three workers on it looking at this well basically obviously you've got the the bow of the ship and it was coming yeah. down like that and then suddenly it just went and it just it just when the ship just went into the into the side of the jetty and it took out this chunk must have been i don't know five six foot deep at the top it's sort of like oh my gosh it, it was just like a just like a big a old dent, a dent or a hole. Uh, it just been pushed in. It been. Right, okay. I'd say it's a hole really. But yeah, I mean, yeah. And uh, and we looked at it. And thought, My God, look at that! And suddenly we all went, "Wow, great! Well, that's it. We're all going home now." I mean, we can't sell him that. <laughs> yeah, hey, we're going home. Hey, mum, put the put the, <laughs> put the spuds on. We're coming home. Because uh, by then it was getting so. Oh God. And, Cabin uh, fever, one oh, month. It so. was. It was definitely like that. Yeah. And uh, fucking, you know, I I can't remember. If we spent another day there. They literally just stuck a panel over it. They they literally just stuck a panel over it because there's only about another month left on the thing. And yeah, that's yeah. it. They they went off. I'll try. I'll try and find the picture so we can. I've got a picture so you can see exactly what it looks like. Okay. Yeah, if you can do that, I'll, I'll stick it in the show notes. Yeah. yeah. The other one was um, Casablanca. Okay, we were sailing okay. into Casablanca before we did the um, transatlantic over to uh, America. Uh, the ship was empty. It was still full of uh, builders on it, refurbishing it. Anybody, any any nautical people out there about the port of Casablanca, you know there is, when you turn into it, there's a lot of cross currents, whatever. Okay. So it's turning into it, turning into it's a new ship. Well, a new ship it was an old one. They're just done up, new to me. And... Um, and we went in there, and we was down below, and and suddenly, you know, the ship sort of like went a bit like that. Okay, yeah. And then the next week it went a bit like that. Cool, that's a bit better. And then the next week it went a bit like that. <laughs> and I was looking out of a porthole, and I could see the water coming towards me. And then and then the wardrobe started to to move, and the door started to open. And it must have been like four of these sways. Literally on the fourth one, I I grabbed my life jacket and i was running upstairs thinking we, we're about to go over this ship's about to roll it is literally and it's got that and the last one um like up upstairs in the uh in the music uh room the piano came out of its little um cups in the floor rolled across um glasses started to smash it was it was like a poseidon adventure it was literally like that and it kept on going like that and and the thing was, the scary thing was it was very slow. It wasn't like, you know, it was just, it was just like this pendulum <laughs> just going like that. And he just hovered there and you think, oh my God, what's, oh my God. And then, uh, so by the end, he was sort of like, you know, you know, running up, going, oh. Um, as I said, there wasn't any passengers on it. But uh, once you then got into the actual port, it then slowed up and it went back to, so we all got in there. Oh God, this, this, this it's just too top heavy. This ship is too. T- Suddenly, we were all ship designers. It's that funnel. Yeah. That funnel's too top heavy. I mean, you know, trouble was we had to do like a, a four day transatlantic crossing. <laughs> I think we all slept with our life jackets on for those yeah. five days, thinking we can. Oh, oh, rather you than me, yeah. I think. Yeah. And then the Bay of Biscay. You don't want to go to the Bay of Biscay. I've been through the Bay of Biscay on a on a ferry, actually, I believe. <laughs> on a Force Nine? Oh, oh no, maybe not Force Nine. I think, oh. I think I was more bored than scared on that. Oh, uh, yeah, that was that was that trip. was that was not a good one. That was not a good one, yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll save the stories for episode 
too. <laughs> Steve, thanks so much for joining me today. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you. Absolute <sighs> pleasure hearing your stories. We did talk about photography. We so did there's, a bit. there's lots to take away. I do take pictures. <laughs> and your aspiring photographers. If anyone wants to check out your pictures or come and say hi. Um, Please come and say hi. I, I'm, where, I'm, where's the best place for me to, what direction should I be pointing them? Well, I'm very active on LinkedIn. As you know, every day yep. I post on there. I come up with some, you know. I literally come up the, the usually either the night before or at, six o'clock in the morning none okay. of my posts are mapped out scheduled all that no i'm very very um re- reactive so come and find me on there um i would say go and look at my website but oh that's a bit old i'm getting a new one done so but yeah hey just just drop, drop us a message you know more than that do you, do you use instagram or anything like that i i know i should but i don't i just oh, uh, i'm very i mean uh, linkedin takes up a chunk of my time uh, yeah and, you know and and I think if I go down any other rabbit holes, like no, Instagram or TikTok or, you know, uh, I'll, I'll just, you know, lies for living, not for looking at your phone all the time. 100%. And I don't think there's any better place for us to end that podcast <laughs> than that statement. Steve, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>